Dear participants, dear friends of the House of the Wannsee Conference, dear guests from near and far, I'd like to welcome you most cordially to today's virtual event on the occasion of the 79th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference entitled Anti-Semitism and the Show Up Between Historicization and Contemporary Reference. My name is Deborah Hartmann. I've been the director of the Memorial Site and Educational Center since December 2020, and I'm very happy about the great interest and the numerous registrations that have reached us in the recent weeks, even beyond the regional borders of Berlin. COVID-19 pandemic has opened up the possibility of reaching a wider audience also outside of the German speaking world. And this is why we decided to tr have this event simultaneously translated into English. I'm happy to welcome Helge Rieders, the chairman of a memorial sponsoring association. An event in the House of the Wannsee Conference, or as the Jewish survivor Joseph Wolf called it, the House of the Final Solution. And a building like that always includes the memory of the murdered and the survivors. And in this context, I would like to most warmly welcome all those survivors who are taking part in our event today. So, dear guests, welcome to our virtual event, Anti-Semitism at the show, marking the 79th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference. My name is Deborah Hartmann, and I'm the new director of the Memorial and Educational Site House of the Wannsee Conference. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. So I would like to tell you about one situation that can happen at any time in this or a similar way, and which is part of the everyday life of Jews today. In a dialogue forum event for Jewish teenagers, um, hosted by the Competence Center for Prevention and, and Empowerment, a pupil told of the following incident that happened at her new Jewish, at her non-Jewish school. She said, at the time when we were discussing the Shoah in class, one day I discovered a graffiti on the wall. It said, you Jew pig. I drew the teacher's attention to it. And she just said, there's no point in even wiping it off. The writer on the wall again anyway, and end of quote. Although, at first glance, an anti-Semitic scribble can hardly be compared to the systematic mass murder, it becomes clear that this incident had its special effect, especially due to the temporal proximity of the study of the Shoah in class. For the student, there's a clear connection between the discussion of the Shoah and the problem and, and, the dis and discussing anti-Semitism in school. She therefore assumes that the teacher with whom they have dealt with the topic also immediately recognizes this connection. But instead, the teacher merely expresses some sort of resigned indifference, completely ignoring the connection between the Shoah and today's forms of anti-Semitism. While on the part of a pupil, the memory serves as an amplifier for discussing anti-Semitism in the reaction to it, the historical event is strictly separated from the present. In such situations, Jews are often even accused of overreacting with regard to these situations. And discussing everyday anti-Semitism is dismissed as being exaggerated, precisely with a reference to the Shoah. How can this be? The way we look at the past and the meaning we ascribe to it and the way it affects us emotionally is always related to our present as well. And as the memory of the Shoah is present in various forms in the present, it almost automatically imposes itself as a direct or indirect frame of reference for the interpretation of current events. And this, of course, has consequences for the classification and categorization of current anti-Semitism. This also addresses memorial sites and their social tasks, as well as the place they occupy in the tangle and the maze of socio-political discourse and debate. Memorial sites are not in a vacuum. We are part of these debates in society and we want to be part of those. And we ourselves are shaped and 
coined in a way by the history dealt with in these places and their con and and by the consequences and this holds true for the visitors also who come to these places with certain expectations and ideas so how does the relationship between past and present manifest itself at historical sites like these what are the limits of what memorial sites can convey to this day the focus of a memorial sites work is and this is quite rightly so on communicating the history of the respective site. Of course, this also implies dealing with the national socialist crimes and remembering the murdered and survivors. For a long time, memorials were also regarded as moral authorities. Whether this is still the case or how this will change due to the change of generations is something that remains to be seen in the years to come. The social, public, and politics partly assume that visits to memorials would lead to the rejection of contemporary anti-Semitism. Dealing with the anti-Semitism of the Nazi era and its murderous consequences should sensitize people to today's forms of anti-Semitic exclusion. It's the empathetic approach to the suffering of the victims that's intended to ban anti-Semitism without placing it as such as at the center of the debate. A problematic effect of this historicizing approach, however, is that Auschwitz becomes, as it were, the norm for anti-Semitic actions and attitudes. And this in turn can lead to the dangers of current anti-Semitism not being recognized or trivialized. This is also evident and very visible in the situation the young student described at the beginning. At memorial sites, anti-Semitism or other forms of discrimination are not necessarily central themes to be dealt with. If current anti-Semitism is addressed, then it is most likely addressed in connection with today's neo-Nazism and right-wing extremism. However, the fact that anti-Semitism can take on different, supposedly more banal, more trivial forms of expression, functions and modes of action is often not taken into account. But can the confrontation with contemporary anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic images and ideas be successfully avoided? Both the young and the adult visitors, as well as the staff members, are more or less strongly influenced by the forms of discrimination that continue to exist to the very day in society. So therefore, we should assume that anti-Semitism can also appear in a memorial site in different ways, not just um, overtly, but also in covert ways. Today's event aims to contribute to working out the connections between the critique of anti-Semitism and historical and political educational work. To what extent is an examination of the history of the Shoah relevant to understanding contemporary anti-Semitism? And what should this examination look like? The Wannsee Conference, and this building generally embody the radicalization of anti-Semitism towards systemic mass murder. This serves to make the transnational event of the Shoah more tangible in, in this one place, but the horror cannot be banned or concentrated on a specific place. And this historicizing view runs the risk of addressing history as something closed. That's why we consciously emphasize commemoration on the one hand, education on the other. The aim of this event is therefore also to classify the historical events in their concrete historical context and on this basis to relate them to the present. Therefore, we will begin today's lecture with a presentation by Michael Wild, who will shed light on the constitution and structures of the national socialist idea of the false Gemeinschaft, before we then engage in a discussion about the consequences for historical research and mediation, as well as for educational work critical of anti-Semitism. First of all, however, I'm pleased to welcome Samuel Salzborn, the contact person of the land of Berlin on anti-Semitism. Samuel is a proven expert in the field of anti-Semitism research and he's published widely in this area. In this context, I would like to particularly highlight his latest publication entitled Collective Innocence, the Defense of Shoah in German Memory. Dear Samuel, here you go. Good evening. 
leider nur virtuell zusammenkommen können, wir können heute nur mehr, virtually today, dass ich die heutige Veranstaltung mit einem Grußwort begleiten darf. Zum einen ist es in meiner on hand, Funktion als Ansprechpartner des Landes Berlin zu Antisemitismus eine Berlin wirklich große Freude, dass die Gedenk- und Bildungsstätte der Haus der Wannsee-Konferenz mit Deborah Hartmann, eine exzellente international renommierte Expertin als neue Direktorin, gewinnen konnte. Und wenn ich mich irre, ist die heutige Veranstaltung auch einer der ersten Termine unter deiner Leitung. Today's event is one of the first encounters held under your leadership, Deborah, and I look forward to future cooperation with the greatest confidence. Aber auch On the other hand, wie wichtig, in my function as a political scientist, I would like to particularly emphasize how important it is in the context of the indispensable commemoration and remembrance of work on national socialism and the Shoah, to reflect not only on the historical, but also on the current political dimension for any examination of antisemitism. And this is precisely the central concern of today's event under the title Antisemitism and the Shoah between Historicism and the Shoah. and the podium sind so hochkarätig gesetzt, dass es vermessen wäre, an dieser Stelle den Thema vorzugreifen. So Dennoch scheint mir ein Aspekt besonders wichtig, den ich hervorheben möchte. Die historisch-politische Bildungsarbeit ist elementar für den gegenwärtigen Kampf. Nicht aus einem instrumentellen Sinn, wie er bisweilen gern besprochen, aber nicht immer mit Inhalt befüllt wird. Sondern aus einer tiefen inhaltlichen Überzeugung, die der Soziologe Theodor Adorno und die in allen bekannten Worte der unhintergehbaren Aufforderung gefasst hat, Zitiere, Denken und Handeln so einzurichten, dass Auschwitz nicht sich wiederhole, nichts Ähnliches geschehe. Dieser Imperativ hat in einer Zeit, in der Antisemitismus in allen politischen Spektren vertreten ist, in einer Zeit, in der politische Milieus sich in der globalen Integrationsideologie des Antisemitismus verbunden fühlen, die in anderen Fragen sind, in einer Zeit, in der, in der antisemitische Einstellung fortlaufend zu Diskriminierung, Gewalt und Mord und Terror führen, seine Bedeutung als zentralste politische Forderung verhalten. Grundlage des heutigen Antisemitismus ist immer, auch in den politischen Milieus, die dies nur unbewusst vollziehen, eine Nichtaufarbeitung der NS-Vergangenheit, die sich mit Erinnerungs- und Schuldabwehr, mit Täter, Opfer und Umkehr, mit Verschwörungsmythen und Projektionen verbindet und über Generationen hinweg tradiert und manifestiert wurde. Insofern scheint mir historisch-politische Bildung im Kampf gegen Antisemitismus als unverzichtbar und elementar, gerade in einer Zeit, in der der antisemitische Angriff auf die Erinnerungskultur auf Hochschule wurde. And commemoration ich bin gespannt is auf den Vortrag und die Diskussion und bin lecture, sehr gewiss, dass wir von den Kolleginnen und Kollegen im Folgenden eine Menge lernen. So, okay, thank you, dear Samuel. As already announced, I would now like to welcome Michael Wild. Michael Wild is a professor of German history, German 20th century history, with a focus on national socialism at the Humboldt University of Berlin. He's also chairman of the academic advisory board of the House of the Vandy Conference. Memorial Site and Education Center. He's published for many years on various aspects of national socialism with a particular focus on perpetrator research. His latest book, Die Ambivalenz des Volkes on National Socialism as a History of Society, was published in 2019. And also on the topic of Volksgemeinschaft, he's published a small booklet entitled Volk, Volksgemeinschaft AFD in 2017. A short note on the format. During the lecture and the discussions, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. Uh, and by the way, this event is going to be recorded and will be made available for a week until the 28th of January. And then there's a question and answer tool, as said, so you're invited and welcome to ask questions and post your questions in the Q&A tool at any time. So dear Michael, the floor is now yours. Deborah, thank you very much for the friendly invitation and introduction. Samuel, 
Thank you very much for your words of introduction that give us food for thought. It is indeed the same that historical and political educational work is a crucial tool to combat anti-Semitism. I'm very pleased to be able to talk a little bit about Volksgemeinschaft and anti-Semitism as a brief talk. I expect it to be about 20 minutes. Just a few ideas about how these two constructions fit together. Volksgemeinschaft or belonging to the people, belonging to the German people is not a genuinely national socialist term. It first gained popularity during the First World War, willing the second statement in August 1914, that from now on he would know no parties but only Germans achieved widespread resonance because it succeeded in representing the desire of many Germans for equality and inclusion, particularly Jewish people and social Democrats in particular hoped that because of their patriotic stance, they would finally be accepted as equals by society in general and as having equal rights as well. But although the cracks in wartime society soon became apparent, the Volksgemeinschaft remained a potent concept that was consistently able to tap into the myth of the unity of the folk in the summer of 1914. In general, at the beginning of the 20th century, we see the concept of the folk gaining more ground over that of the nation. It was precisely the ambiguity of the folk, the people, that made the term attractive in contrast to nation, which was primarily tied to the ambiguity of the nation state and the cultural nation and always had a reference to the classical nation of France and its emergence through the revolution. Nation was tied to state to a far greater extent than folk, maybe to order as well. And unlike nation, folk was much easier to ethnicize in a racist, anti-Semitic way, a folkish way. Since the Germans, in view of their state fragmentation, had long been unable to define themselves as a classical nation state, they were particularly susceptible to an ethnicization of the concept of the folk, the concept of the people or the folk as demos in Greek, from which democracy comes, which was characterized by civic equality and judicial unity, is contrasted with the idea of the folk as ethnos, in which imagined communities of descent, historical myths, phantasms of shared blood and soil are interwoven. Only biologism stamps the otherness of the other as a fact of nature, inescapably invoking genetic and no longer merely genealogical differences that can no longer be assimilated but must be excluded. Similarly, in Germany, since the 19th century, Gemeinschaft or community or people has been the antithesis of Gesellschaft or society as an expression of criticism of the rapid dynamization and pluralization of social relations in the wake of industrialization, secularization, market orientation, and political liberalism. The longing for Gemeinschaft always arises from a re reaction against a present that is perceived as bad. Thus, the reality of such community models is not to be sought in the past, to which they usually refer, but in the present and directed toward the future. The concept of Gemeinschaft or community embodies hope of overcoming alienation, both in revolutionary and restorative terms. This ambivalence, both to restore what is considered lost and in the future to bring about what is seen as desirable as a social order has been inherent in the concept of Gemeinschaft from the very beginning. Therefore, it would be misunderstanding the concept of Volksgemeinschaft to take it as a description of an actually existing social reality. The political power of talk of Volksgemeinschaft lay not in stating the actual state of society, but in the promise, in the mobilization that it entailed. When we speak of Volksgemeinschaft, Volksgemeinschaft 
became, as the historian Hans Ulrich Tama pointed out, was a dominant political defining concept in Germany even before 1933. The liberal parties emphasized the Volksgemeinschaft as having a socially harmonious, inclusive aspect across all classes, quote unquote. And for the Social Democrats as well, the Volksgemeinschaft was used as a term in a sense to create an image of having a working class that has since expanded into a body of working people facing a small and unjustif unjustifiably powerful minority of monopoly capitalists and big landowners. And in Friedrich Ebert's speeches as president of the Reich, the Volksgemeinschaft as a concept including included all who worked. All the workers had a firm place in it. In contrast, the political right wing, especially the National Socialists or Nazis, despite all the rhetoric of inclusion, clearly understood the Volksgemeinschaft primarily in terms of its exclusionary dimension. It was not so much the question of who belonged to the people, the community of the people, the Volksgemeinschaft, that was paramount, but rather who was not permitted to belong to it, precisely those alien to the Gemeinschaft who were already excluded by the very term, first and foremost, the Jews. Anti-Semitism played a crucial role in this, for in the construction of Das Volk, or the people as a natural community based on blood, the anti-Semitic demarcation line was an intrinsic part. Anti-Semitism was what created the National Socialist Volksgemeinschaft. Anti-Semitism fueled its radicalism and its destructive potential as well. In the party program of the NSDAP from 1920, and I quote, only those can be citizens who are Volksgenossen or members of the German people. Only those of German blood can be members of the German people or Volksgenossen, regardless of their religion. Therefore, no Jew can be a member of the German people or Volksgenossen. It was stated in no uncertain terms in the party program. And it was clear that Jewish people were not to belong to the people, the folk. So it is this anti-Semitism that is the key differentiating criterion of those ideas of Volksgemeinschaft that saw their point of reference in what was known as the August experience for August 1914 explicitly included all Germans, including Jewish and social democratic ones. Conversely, this means that the inseparability of anti-Semitism and the National Socialist Volksgemeinschaft also meant that all who saw the National Socialists' promise of inclusion as correlating with their own views and to whom the Nazi regime propaganda of a Volksgemeinschaft, especially after 1933, simultaneously adopted the anti-Semitic exclusion. So even before 1933, if people who believed in the Volksgemeinschaft didn't have to be anti-Semites, but if you, in the Nazi regime, continued to believe after 1933 that the Volksgemeinschaft was an ideal that you had, you had to have become an anti-Semitism. That was factored in by then. <clears throat> This was clear pretty much from the beginning. Even during the staging of what was known as the Day of Potsdam on the 21st of March, 1933, the Nazi leadership, which was in the process of conquering total power, appealed to the common ground between the old and the new right wing. We know the photograph of Hitler and Hindenburg, Hindenburg between conservatives and fascists, between reactionary society drawn along class lines and the Volksgemeinschaft. But the new Nazi leaders left no doubt about the anti-Semitic nature of the National Socialist 
concept of the Volksgemeinschaft as the boycott of Jewish shops just a few days later on the 1st of April clearly proved to all. By this time, anyone who still adhered to the Volksgemeinschaft under the Nazi regime unequivocally accepted or supported anti-Semitism. But the Volksgemeinschaft was also a concept for mobilizing people. The break in 1933 with the German Republic's constitutionality under the rule of law offered many of the elite a scope of latitude that they had always called for. Finally, doctors believed that they could heal the German Volkskörper, the people's body, and they were given the opportunity to do so with the law for the prevention of hereditary diseases passed in July 1933, which for the first time in Germany allowed forced sterilization against the will of the individual. In the first three years alone, the newly created so-called hereditary health courts, which besides a judge included two doctors, heard almost 225,000 cases and in 199,000 cases, that is in 90% ruled in favor of sterilization. Criminal investigators were given the opportunity no longer constrained by law and order to create what Patrick Patrick Wagner called a Volksgemeinschaft without criminals and willingly adopted criminological biological premises according to which social groups defined by race were interned and annihilated as quote unquote antisocial elements in concentration camps and later annihilated. Social welfare offices no longer categorized their clients based on their need but on their ability to work along the lines of those who cannot work don't need to eat. And here too, race-based criteria, racist Nazi criteria soon dictated the selection of those who were useful, quote unquote, to the Volksgemeinschaft from those who were alien to the German people, quote unquote, even tax officials with the Tax Adjustment Act of 1934, according to which tax laws were to be interpreted in line with the National Socialist worldview had every freedom to enforce inequality themselves, i.e. to impose particular tax burdens, especially on Jews, instead of ensuring the equality of all citizens before the law. Volksgemeinschaft also meant individuals gaining new power and opening up options to act in a racist manner. And finally, National Socialism also offered scope for latitude, for violence. At the same time, violence made the aspired Volksgemeinschaft visible by drawing a sharp and insurmountable line between us and the enemies of the people through political campaigns such as the boycott of Jewish shops. With anti-Semitism, this social distance could be created, overcoming any kind of support to isolate Jewish neighbors, stigmatizing any solidarity and any form of compassion for people who are persecuted in order to isolate Jewish neighbors and declare them deprived of rights, even as fair game. Thus the boycott of Jewish shops was by no means limited to the 1st of April, 1933, but represented an effective campaign targeting Jewish neighbors, especially in the provinces, in the small towns and villages. The boycott allowed various types of action to be explored from public posters and banners to standing guard directly in front of their shops, to demanding people not enter the shop, to insults and the use of violence. And in addition to the violent boycott operations in the summer of 1935, several months before the Nuremberg laws were enacted in September, campaigns denouncing love relationships between Jews and non-Jews as quote unquote Rassenschande or racial defilement likewise increased. All over the Reich, such aggression accusations were made, always accompanied by aggressive public attacks in newspapers and leaflets or demonstrations in which the alleged, quote unquote, Rassenschänder or racial defilers were led through the city by force. 
looking at the photographs of those processions that took place in broad daylight in public, we are struck by the crowds that accompanied such processions. Women, children, youths are walking alongside, laughing, mocking, insulting, spitting at the victims, the Jewish victims. These onlookers, these curious people, these passers-by, these bystanders, which is such a, a harmlessing word, they're not just standing by, they were actually a crucial, indispensable element of these operations, whatever their inner attitude to these events, which took place in public for the very reason of fundamentally changing this public and changing this public more violent to more violence. The Nazi regime turned violence into a collective phenomenon and allowed the Volksgenossen or members of the German people to participate in this violence. And any act of violence broke through and breaks through boundaries by the very fact that this violence could happen then and in some cases now without any punishment for breaking the law changed the order of things in which new altered options for action were now possible that previously had not been open as a course of action. Thus, in this action is a radicalization of violence that is inherent because this opens new spaces of violence for radicalization if it is not contained and sanctioned. Violence could be used to mobilize. Violence broke through the local political and cultural order. And those who were merely onlookers supposedly contributed to the erosion of this order. Through violence, the Jewish enemies, quote unquote, of the Volksgemeinschaft could be attacked directly, robbed of their dignity, disempowered, and at the same time, the perpetrators experienced their superiority. And thus, in the very moment of the act of violence, they established the racist hierarchy that an anti-Semitic anti -Semitic hierarchy that the National Socialists were aspiring to. After the November program of 1938, the regime leadership had decided not to initiate such an uncontrollable outbreak of violence within Germany again, but they were able to direct the unbounded willingness to commit violent acts externally during the war. In 1939, or during the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, that is in the years in which anti-Semitic violence radicalized to mass murder and the Shoah, the members of the Hitler Youth who had taken part in the violent campaigns against German Jews, the boycott in 1935 and 36 may well have been the very young soldiers of the Wehrmacht for whose violent crimes against Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, and Latvian Jews, we are searching for explanations for to this very day. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. <clears throat> So thank you, first of all, dear Michael. Shortly, we shall be coming back to the content of your lecture. But before we do that, I would like to introduce the other two panelists. It's just that I can't see them. I do now. Wonderful. Hello there and welcome. At this point, I would like to introduce Eva Gubarova. She's a journalist and an author. For many years, she has been working as a guide at the National Concent Social Concentration Camp Dachau, and she's been a project head for um, anti-Semitic um, conspiracy theories at the Dachau Memorial site. This is a collaboration with the Bielefeld faculty of um, educational research and she organizes seminars for teenagers. Her last book is 
on a trip to visiting the last Jews of Eastern Europe. It was published in 2017, and I think she's just preparing the publication of her new author with the book, The Diagnose Hatred Against Jews. So welcome to you, Eva Gruberova. I would also like to introduce Marina Chernivsky. She's a psychologist and behavioral scientist. She works and researches on Shoah, anti-Semitism and discrimination. She is a lecturer and supervisor, and she heads the Competence Center for Prevention and Empowerment, who I alluded to in my introduction. And also she is a founder and um, manager of a um, of an advisory desk. She also is a member of the second independent expert group on anti-Semitism of the German Bundestag. And um, she is the co-editor of um, the magazine Yalta and the co-author of the recently published research report of anti-Semitism in the context of schools, which you can retrieve from the website of the Competence Center. So first of all, I would like to come to the present before we come back to Michael Wills' lecture, and I would like to speak about the events that took place at the city of Halle in Germany. You might have seen that there's a um, photo of the door of the Halle synagogue um, on our leaflets announcing this event in October um, 2019. A right-wing extremist tried to break into the Halle synagogue building and after this was not successful, he killed two people outside the synagogue's doors and injured two more. And I think it was just last December that the offender was convicted. And as he was carrying out this attack, he never um, made him any, he never um, made a secret of his attitude. And the self-mobilization we just spoke about also shows a longing for a homogeneous community of the people. One of the survivors spoke of two attacks incurred um, on the synagogue of Halle in 2018 and 2019. And in many of the media pieces, we heard that if this attack had been successful, it would have been the worst anti-Semitic attack on a synagogue after the Holocaust ended. So we can already tell from these events and from the way this was covered in the news that there's a number of examples where we can see lines of connection drawn between the present and the past. And Marina, what's the impulse to look back? Maybe in this context, you can speak about the differences between the perspective of Jews and the perspective of non-Jews, because this is something which in your work is has been very present, hasn't it? So what's your take? Does it help us uh, to look back as we look at anti-Semitism? Is it necessary? What does it mean for dealing with the for the Einladung und uh, auch den Vortrag oh, und uh, uh, Debi für deine Einführung. Bin ich zu hören? Ja, um, so yeah, okay. Ja, du hast eine sehr wichtige Frage gestellt und sie ist so groß, dass ich mich frage tatsächlich, wo ich mich besonders fokussieren kann. Ich denke, du hast einen sehr wichtigen Satz gesagt. Sollen wir, müssen wir darauf zurückgreifen oder geschieht der Rückgriff vielleicht auch von selbst? Nicht jede solche Handlung ist bewusst entschieden. Der Rückgriff auf die Vergangenheit entsteht durch eine tiefe Verantwortung. Ankerung ähm, der Erinnerung, aber natürlich auch durch eine sehr weitreichende und tief ähm, gründige Auseinandersetzung, die die Überlebenden und ihre Nachkommen geführt haben. Auch wenn geschwiegen wurde, war die Shoah 
präsent und stets auch Teil der Familienbiografie von vielen äh, jüdischen Überlebenden und ihren Kindern. Und du hast ja ähm, eine ähm, Nebenklägerin angesprochen, die einen sehr expliziten äh, Bezug äh, zur Vergangenheit hergestellt hat, aber es gab noch andere Nebenklägerinnen in diesem Prozess, die äh, ganz explizit äh, darauf hingewiesen haben, in welcher Rolle und mit welchen ähm, Emotionen, mit welchen Rückgriffen sie in diesem Saal stehen und dass sich in diesen Prozess einbringen. Und das war, glaube ich, ja sicherlich war das bei vielen Menschen, bei vielen And NebenklägerInnen eine bewusste Entscheidung, diesen with, Rückgriff uh, ähm, many of those people involved oder diese Verbindung herzustellen, in aber bei vielen von ihnen war diese Verbindung einfach da. Sie musste nicht this geholt werden. Was und damit there will already. ich einfach They sagen, to, um, dass die Shoah und der Nationalsozialismus und die Verfolgung to it, these von Menschen ähm, einen ständigen Referenz äh, so darstellt und Bezug, of ähm, zumindest the past das für die people. Ähm, Nachkommen der Überlebenden ähm, sicherlich nicht für jeden und für alle, aber es ist im kollektiven äh, im Familien, äh, biografischen Gedächtnis und auch im kollektiven gesellschaftlichen Gedächtnis, im Gedächtnis der Gemeinschaft tief verankert und es gibt nichts ähm, Gewaltvolleres, glaube ich, aus meiner Sicht äh, in unserer Zeit, ja, äh, als dieses Recht, äh, diese Menschen abzusprechen, ja, die Verbindungen herzustellen. Of establishing das ist sozusagen a connection auch ein Teil for, der Auseinandersetzung, für die people and for the descendants sind. of ja, also the victims. Hat sich so um, nobody elected Erbe on purpose to be born to a um, certain family or zu haben. to a certain context. Und deswegen will ich einfach sagen, ja, es gibt of, auch aus dem Blick äh, von ähm, der, der Genozidforschung ja, und der Shoah-Forschung einen Genocide sehr wichtigen Grund, äh, die Vergangenheit nicht anzugleichen, die Erinnerungen auch nicht anzugleichen, sondern es gibt not, unterschiedliche um, Zugänge zu einem und demselben historischen Ereignis There's und es ist gewaltvoll und victimisierend, wenn die Überlebenden und ihre Kinder und die Kinder ihre Kinder sich nicht so erinnern können, wie sie sich erinnern wollen und müssen. Und die Verbindung ist aus meiner Sicht an dieser Stelle eine Chance ja, und eine, eine sehr wichtige Remembering ein, äh, bietet einen sehr wichtigen a Anschluss für die very important opportunity Und da will ich tatsächlich einen Punkt nochmal einbringen, um, and to remember, wir haben, du hast Historisierung äh, am Anfang und das ist ein, ein sehr wichtiger Aspekt äh, bei der Auseinandersetzung, bei der Analyse des gegenwärtigen Antisemitismus und bei der Analyse der, in the in the der Kontinuität von Antisemitismus in der Nachkriegsgesellschaft oder in den beiden deutschen Staaten ist heute. Both um, in the GDR Antisemitismus and, wird historisiert und damit um, und dadurch ist der Germany. Zugriff so zu diesem Thema extrem schwierig. Is being put in ja, das sehen wir, context, das wissen wir aus so hard to access it today. Das, we know this wissen wir jetzt auch aus den jüngsten empirischen Studien. Es gab auch 80er Jahre, 90er Jahre Debatten und Diskurse, die leider keinen Eingang gefunden haben ja, in die hiesige Diskussion. Ich meine 50er Jahre Adorno und seine Schule. Also es ist eigentlich alles gesagt und dennoch hat es nicht of Theodore Adorno ja, and his school of thinking and still um, it never really came over yeah. to us. Marina, I'm yeah. sorry <laughs> for interrupting you. It seems that you are on the English channel as you're speaking, so we cannot translate you into English. So <laughs> what machen, damit am I to do wird? now? Ich, um... What should I do now? Okay, so if you see the interpreters Globe there, please choose the German channel, okay? Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I, I might have been going on for too long now. What I wanted to say is that historicization or putting thing, things in a historical context is not everything. It's a very important element of under, making us understand what our relationship with history is or our relationship with anti-Semitism as an order of violence, because it isn't just an attitude, it isn't just a system of um, conviction, it's a structural and institutional order of violence. It is constitutive of uh, a number of groups and ideologies, and it leads to lethal violence. The Halle attack wasn't the only attack on Jewish contemporary life and institutions and people. 
anticipating that violence is has been a secret companion of um, all Jewism in, in, in Europe and in Israel. So the continuity of violence is something that Jews have been dealing with for a very long time. On historicization, I wanted to add an important element, namely distancing, keeping a distance, creating distance. We are moving in a time related distance of Shoah, and there's also an emotional distance. These axes are very important for our work. And the biographical and um, emotional distance, even though the time driven distance holds true for everyone. But the other two factors mean the emotional and the biographical distance is something that we've all been through in a very different way. And being gassed in a gas chamber is not the same thing as being killed in in fighting on the, on the battlefield in war in a war this way of being persecuted and annihilated and exterminated has to do with dehumanization it has to do with having your rights taken away from you as a human being and this um prevails in time the idea that this same thing could be done again in the present and that Jews could become prey again. This is an idea that's been touched a number of times. This basic right to existence, to, to safety, taking that away. So um, the Halle attack was an incision. This was a decisive moment. And there are people who are left to themselves li to living with the consequences of that. But it wasn't a surprise. This does something to us. It does something in relation to us. But it is part of a series of attacks that have shown an impact on German society. So in conclusion, I would like to say that going back to the past is absolutely vital if we are to understand the reason for this connection. If we want to understand this, if we want to get closer to what that connection with the past is, also to make it a, a means and cornerstone of today's education. And only if we let that happen, we will be able to move differently in that space of commemoration. It's a different feeling of self-efficacy. If young people today ask themselves, who am I? Am I a passive recipient of this past? Or do I stand at its end looking into the future? And am I a person who wants to make an impact in the future? Do I want to wonder what I need this past for? Do I have to live with this past? Do I recognize my own aggression, my own reaction to things? Can I understand my own behavior? So, of course, it would, this would be going too far to today. But I think Samuel Salzborn said it. Historical and political education is very important, but it should never be left in a void. It, it is something that requires a paradigm shift in our way of uh, coming to terms with history. This is very complex. We can't just simply m mediate the um, this owning of history, it is not supposed to happen in a feeling of distance and of uh, separation, of rejection of these questions, which of course come up. It's been a number of generations of Germans, Jewish Germans who have had to live with this distance and at the same time we've been dealing with the historical context this has produced its own void it's produced a situation in which many young people are not being are not able to cope because many do not even understand what they should what they what they should do it for in the first place and what the added value can be. So there was one student in one of my seminars at the Competence Center who once said, and this is the quote I would like to leave you with. 
she said, T that um, time is something I understand, but it doesn't give me an emotion. So my school time was um, over and I made a full stop and I never again looked back in time. But is that what we want or do we want something else? I do make a plea for the second alternative and the connection you alluded to is so important. Thank you very much to you, Marina, for that. And we will come back to some of these points, particularly the question of which role cognitive knowledge transmission plays in historical, political, educational work, or what should play or does play. You also referred to the Halle attack as being a radical cut in history, and that it was about the most extreme form of violence. And of course, this link between that form of extreme violence can be also made to supposedly low threshold forms of anti-Semitist violence and attacks and attitudes and sort of casual anti-Semitism, if you know what I mean. The way of dealing with the Shoah and the Nazi past is something that many different politicians regularly play down and relativize. We're all too familiar with that, particularly in recent years. And this includes the positive charging of this concept of the Volksgemeinschaft, which we've just heard more about from Michael Wild. Now, Eva, you yourself have encountered this sort of attitude in a trip to Dacha with students where a right-wing extremist YouTuber with his cameraman went to the memorial of Dacha, wanted to film there against the cult of guilt, so-called. And at the end, the group of students, he spoke to them and appealed to them not to believe everything that he is told. You intervened, you prevented him being able to shoot his film, and since then are in a legal dispute with him, which is pending, ongoing, and even though he was sentenced for incitement to violence against minorities, he has appealed this decision. I would be interested in knowing what it means for memorial sites if they become locations where such things can happen. And Dachau is not the only memorial site that has been in the focus of critically engaging with this. And it's not just German language Shoah memorial sites, but also outside of Germany. So what needs to be done here or changed, would you say? Well, thank you very much, Deborah, for the question and for your invitation to speak here today. The Nikolai Nailing is the name of this man. And this case is not just one case. The memorial sites, at least that's how I experience it, are increasingly getting visitors that relativize Nazi crimes. Their rev revisionist, revisionist anti semitic anti-Semitic attitudes come across in so-called naive, supposedly naive questions, knowing about this border of what you can say and what you can't say and what can be challenged in a court of law. The memorial sites have visitors that show this openly in the form of the Hitler greeting, the Hitler salute. This isn't new. It's not the first time that we've experienced these things, but what is new, at least based on my perception, it's still a minority, it's a small group, but they're becoming louder and louder. They're becoming more and more confident and more and more aggressive. What I see behind this is a specific strategy that the right-wing extremists go to be provocative in the memorial sites. You forget this quite quickly, but the we memorial we who worked in the memorial sites were not just historical sites, but also political sites, and we still are. We emerged in a long battle in the post-war period of for remembrance and the way the, these crimes, these German crimes were dealt with. They are part of the social consensus and they are a commitment essentially of the historical guilt of Germany. And it is about this social consensus today. 
this social consensus, which was negotiated for a long time in various different disputes that took place in West Germany, as it was then, this the attempt is to break this down, to shake this consensus by talking about the so-called cult of death. In the case of Nicole Nelling, luckily the judges saw exactly what it was about but there are plenty of cases where this is not the case now i'm not here speaking to you as a representative of the dachau concentration camp memorial site i'm as a journalist i wasn't socialized here so perhaps i have a slightly different take on things more a more external perspective and for 15 years, I have worked in mediation in the various different educational organizations. And I just want to give you a sense of how I see things. It is my opinion, because your question referred a little bit to, well, I understood it is, you know, what would be desirable? What is it we would like to see? I would like these things to be seen more. I would like policymakers and society at large to see and to acknowledge that the memorial sites, for the reasons I listed earlier, are places of fragility and what emotional stress it triggers for a memorial site. The colleagues of mine who are working in the historical political educational field and encountering right-wing extremists of this kind, I must say, I. Personally, after this incident for 2019, after Nicole, the meeting with Nicole Nelling, I couldn't sleep that night. I kept thinking about what I should have done or what I could have done and what I ought to have done. Did I say what I should have said? Particularly because on that particular day, he charged me with an, uh, allegedly insulting him because I called him a neo-Nazi. At that point, I was questioned by a police officer on that very day. I mean, I personally think it is important, and I'm not just talking about the memorial sites, but also about the schools. I think it's important that you create a climate in society or work towards it in which everyone knows how important it is to take a stand and at the same time to ensure that you have the safety emotionally in the sense that you know that you won't be left alone if you do take a stand in a situation like that. A case occurs to me that many of you, I imagine, will remember or will have heard about. I think it was two or three years ago. It was about a 15-year-old high school student in Dresden who basically leaked anti-Semitic group class chats and she received a prize for courage at the time but she was ganged up against so incredibly in, when she went back to school by the, her fellow students and even by teachers in some cases that she had to switch schools i believe that we need to talk about how we're going to deal with issues like this in the future if, for example, we come with study groups where there are people who are members of the far right Alternative for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, who call the Nazi past bird shit in life or something like that, and all of these other things that they say. I mean, how do we deal with that? And what sort of consequences is that going to have for our remembrance policy and in some cases it's already the case and in the future it'll be even more that there are representatives of far-right afd supporters in bodies deciding in the future whether school trips should go to the memorial sites and whether they should receive funding for such school trips and i'm seeing memorial sites as having a duty to do even more historical political education work than they do already. There has to be even more of a taking a clear stance on what right-wing extremist and anti-Semitic developments are concerned. I think it's extremely important. 
and the concentration camp memorial site of Dachau is doing this and other educational policy organizers are too, so that multipliers are better trained and equipped and sensitized to what anti-Semitism actually is. And we've heard this a couple of times. It's not something that begins with the Shoah or with the gas chambers. It is the current forms of anti-Semitism that we're experiencing in our society. And so even refusing to accept the guilt of the Nazi crimes is, where, is, is another form of it. And what you were saying in the beginning, Deborah, I'd like to refer to now, that we need to talk about Halle and the white terrorists there, but it's also about everyday anti-Semitism too. I don't think we should make the mistake of only focusing on right-wing extremism or only focusing on anti-Semitism anti in some of the Arab and Muslim communities. But that's that happens, but it's always sort of the, that's always like the focus is on the anti-Semitism of the others. I remember, and Marina Chernevsky will remember this, we met in Berlin one time, and there was a big issue there, the imported anti-Semitism. That was a big topic at the time. But that's just making things too easy. An interview partner said, in a country of the Shoah, there's no imported anti-Semitism. We need to talk about the everyday anti-Semitism that is anti-Semitism that we find in the heart of this society. You know, these comments that are supposedly funny, you know, these sort of chimney jokes or the attacks on German Jews who are made responsible for the Israeli policy all the way up to physical attacks on Jews. That is what Jewish people in Germany experience every day of their lives. And there simply is an awareness of this problem that's there. And I mean, Marina Chernivsky described it pretty clearly before. There is a real problem of perception and it affects all of us very much. What I'm also missing is a sort of general sense of outrage about this as well. So it's not just about solidarity and empathy with those who are impacted on by anti-Semitism, but also the outrage. If you hear that, that on German streets since last spring, the Shoah is being relativized. The victims of the Shoah are being mocked be it by wearing the yellow star or by the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and the mocking of Anne Frank. We're, we're seeing the uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories a lot in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic as well. But for example, you know, if I compare my country, Slovakia with Czech Republic or other countries as well, what we're seeing is that I would say this is something that's very German and that this is reflected both in this sort of the kind of anti-Semitism that denies the guilt, but also the anti-Israeli attitudes like that the virus comes from Mossad or from Israeli labs, but they're also very deep seated classic types of anti-Semitic views and a great deal of ignorance regarding the Shoah and the Nazi past. And this isn't just something that's true of right-wing extremists or far-right AFD supporters, but also people who come from the bourgeois center of society, the heart of society. We are very far from having critically engaged with the past here in Germany, as Mr. Salzburg said in his introductory remarks. Well, thank you very much, Eva, for your introductory words here. Of course, there's so many questions I'd like to ask you in, in the context of some of the things that you've said. We can look at this as well, whether or not there's a consensus that memorial sites are political. You describe them as political sites that must position themselves more clearly. But that's a question that is going through my mind at the moment, whether or not that really is a consensus within the memorial sites. Perhaps we can talk about that a bit more in a moment. You were quite right when you said that we mustn't just look at the right-wing extremists and focus on their anti-Semitism. But still, let me briefly come back or would like to ask 
a question to you, Michael, about the talk that you made earlier on, where you talked about the constitution of the Volksgemeinschaft concept and the centrality of anti-Semitism in this context. What reference do you see to the present day now? Does the idea of the Volksgemeinschaft still play a role in relevant parts of society? And not just in parts of society who are necessarily always focusing on, who are right-wing extremists, to come back to what Eva said. So does this play a role in parts of society that are not right-wing extremists? And what's the situation regarding anti-Semitism there? I do believe it plays a role, yes, in the far-right AFD and in the right-wing scene. Certainly the Volksgemeinschaft is a concept that comes up again and again. And what I was trying to communicate in my brief talk was to say once again that if until 1933 you talked about the Volksgemeinschaft, you didn't automatically have to be an anti-Semite. But if, to, if you use the concept Volksgemeinschaft after 1933 in the Nazi site, then you were inescapably a supporter of anti-Semitism. And if after 1945, you still talk about a Volksgemeinschaft, then there is a clear reference to the Shoah that is evident. There is somebody today, if somebody today talks about a Volksgemeinschaft, they are trying to interject a concept in the discourse. They're trying to shift the discourse towards a, you know, a concept of the folk, which is not in line with the constitution or with a people subject to the rule of law of citizens. It is a folkish concept, i.e. driven by German nationalism. And I think you can do a litmus test if somebody uses the term by say, those who have this sort of German nationalist term of Volksgemeinschaft always will talk about who does not belong. It's always an excluding aspect, which is definitive for the term of a nationalist, a Volkish concept of Volksgemeinschaft. So even if you if use this term, if you pull it out, then it's you don't want to have anything to do with the people governed by a, the rule of law here in Germany. And you have a different sense of the folk or the people as the one set out in our basic law here in Germany. So anyone who, who bandies the term about today, the Volksgemeinschaft clearly doesn't have much in common with the constitution. There's one other thing that I'd like to say because something that Marina Chernivsky said is really making me think and I think that actually she's made a quite an important point there. And that is that history, in fact, has the runs the risk of generating distance because you can say, but it's in the past. And the Shoah, as atrocious as it is, if you take it as a historical event and say, well, it was terrible, but it's in the past and we have nothing to do with it now. And so there doesn't have to be a culture of remembrance anymore. All of this, these approaches that we hear from the far right AFD party and its supporters, certainly what's on my mind, what I'm thinking about in this context is that the Shoah hasn't been just suddenly, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It is part of a radicalization. And this radicalization is not inevitable in the mass murder. There are particular constitutions that led to the Shoah. The Second World War was clearly part of this, but the Shoah shows what is possible and what was possible once is possible. And this is something we will bear with us always that what happened is possible. What, uh, what Hannah Arendt said must ought never to have happened but it's the steps that led up to it that are so decisive as well. And this is why I refer to the 1933 and 1945 use of the term. And that brings us to the present day because these steps that we're experiencing now and these false analogies are one, ones in the sense that Marina just described it with the possibility of distancing ourselves from history. You know, we're not living in like in 1932, no. The point is we are living in a time in which we can no longer be certain that those 
who are there to protect our constitution in terms of the police and the judiciary are really going to protect our constitution and the right wing extremism right wing extremists have no business being in the police or in the judiciary we must ensure that these are democrats protecting our constitution in this position and this is why what eva grubarova said as well is true we need to be sure that when people are discriminated in public and we notice it that there are other people who stand up for them who take a stand it, so if an anti-semitic slur is painted on the wall that there must be people who will accept it that it's just left there and if the teacher says what's well, going to come back in a minute that the other teachers must say something or the other students must say something not just it has to be removed it has to be addressed as an issue in the class this has to be discussed how such a thing could be put on the wall in the first place and these are situations when we allow them and this was one of the arguments I was making. If we allow them, we are opening spaces that trigger more violence and allow more violence. Thus, we must stop these developments. We must prevent radicalization. We must take a stand against anti-Semitism and discrimination. And I think that history can play a role here because if we talk about and examine radicalization, become a sensitivity of where we are now and where we need to intervene. Okay, thank you, Michael. I will come back to you later on on the type of role history can play in this process, but maybe we'll do that later. Still, I would like to connect what you just said, Michael, to what Eva Gruberova said before, namely the fact that memorial sites need to come in and um, take their part of the work, which raises the question of it, prevention and showing solidarity with the potentially affected. And in my introduction, I also said that there still is an idea of historical learning about the Shoah creating a rejection of anti-Semitism. And for a long time, we thought that memorial sites could make us immune against today's exclusion through historical learning. Now, Michael Wilt said history can play a role in this. But as a matter of fact, what's the situation we see on the ground? And Eva, you have been working for 15 years at the Dachau Memorial site, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experiences in your work. What's the limit of the work we can do in raising awareness at memorial sites? Where does this end? At what point? Well, so I think we need to take a differentiated approach here. The bad news is that it's actually true what you said, Deborah. It's just like you said, we cannot assume that historical knowledge and um, teaching would help us shape our morale and that it would be like being put in the washing machine and as you come out, you could be cleansed and um, free of any anti-Semitism after visiting a memorial site, but that's not what happens. During the trips I organized for students at the memorial site, I saw that students did show empathy with um, the victims of Nazi terror, but then again, they they find it difficult to to uh, not believe that there's Jewish bankers who own the world, and they find it difficult to refrain from using um, anti-Jewish slurs and the like. So this idea that I can very much understand this idea of society that the fact of visiting a memorial site, which takes some two to three hours, will help. 
substantially is something I cannot adhere to, and I will explain why. So for teenagers, as they come to a memorial site, the authentic location is in the background because what they see is uh, the watchtowers, they see the gate, Labour said she free, this is what they read, and they are interested in living history on site. They're interested in the historical facts. They want to know what happened at this place. They want to understand what happened. So that much is true. And as they visit a memorial site, teenagers do perceive that historical facts are at the foreground. And considering the enormous gaps in knowledge there is on Shoah, which is something I see in my workshops, because I see that school students don't know what happened at Dachau. They don't know what happened during the Holocaust. They don't know what happened during Shoah. They don't know much about history. So I see there's, there's a lot of need to catch up there. And 50% of Germans believe that it was only a handful of perpetrators who killed millions of Jews. And I would like to warn against thinking that historical teaching can be done half-heartedly and that we can focus on today's politics, because as we do that, that's us running into problems. How do we want to explain uh, to school students what um, anti-Semitism warding of guilt actually is if they never want to face the fact that their own ancestors might have been involved in these crimes and if they're not ready to take in the type of crime that happened and what it means to this very day for the affected families, for their descendants, for society as a whole, or what it's um, meant for the founding of the state of Israel. It's vital, as I believe, to say that such visits to memorial sites must be prepared and must be post-processed, but often there's no time to do that in, stu in school. This in turn doesn't mean that visiting memorial site wasn't to set important and an important impulse. It is meant to do that. But as we teach students about anti-Semitism, it is very important we set our focus on the very form and shape this teaching takes, because we will not see empathy arising automatically as students come to memorial site. It's very important to help students access history with the example of individual stories, they need to understand the perspectives of, of, of the victims. And it's important to understand that the history of the German Jews is part of German history. Jews weren't just a minority in society, but they always were part of our people. And um, as we think of the so-called majority society of today, this leads us to the question of why so many people were bystanders during National Socialism. Why would people clap their hands at the moment their neighbors were deported? What did this mean for post-war Germany? Why is Jewish and German still used as a, as a contradiction to, to this very day? Why is there a difference between the evil Nazis and the Germans? So we need to bridge this gap of history and the present. This is where we, where we trigger a true um, coming to terms and thinking about the past. Because as students notice that this has to do something with their own lives and that this is also their cause maybe, then they might be into it or might be into it more. And it won't do just to take a first visit around the memorial site. The best thing 
would be to have um, a couple of days on the memorial site with workshops tailored to teenagers' lives. For example, with the Mannheim Study Center, we're currently developing pedagogical and teaching materials to um, teach about anti-Jewish conspiracy theories. And it is very important to do that. It's my impression that the failure of of society that we see in overall terms is oftentimes handed down to the memorial sites and we are perceived to be responsible but i think it's rather school to be the place most responsible for teaching children and this responsibility for teaching children cannot be passed on so teachers must be put in a position to understand subtle forms of anti-semitism for example i had an example and an experience with seven history teachers, school teachers, who said that there was that there were cases of anti-Semitism at the school, but this was only because of the Muslims at the school. And then asked about um, racial slurs against Jews, and then they admitted that German school students would also use these words and call the others Jews, and that this was supposedly just for fun. So this already tells us what happens in society. So we need to look in the mirror first and look at our own resentments and find our own blind spots in this to be able to recognize these, these problems in the first place. Because as I believe this debate on this type of problems, on anti-Semitism, right at the heart of society, this is where we have to really put our finger on a spot that really hurts. We need to take a look at universities. There was a university lecturer in Germany who for 10 years would tell their students that in Israel, doctors would have been trading organs of Palestinians and uh, this was tolerated. And that's these classical anti-Jewish uh, myths and legends that are often spread. And it, is, it isn't just memorial sites who can um, do something against this. Thank you very much, Eva. I think you've really given us a very clear image there as to how memorial sites have to work every day, what they are confronted with and what problems and challenges they're facing, but also this question of self-reflection is also a key question, an issue that affects the people who work at these memorial sites as well. How do we raise our own awareness as people who work at memorial sites and perhaps are not free of anti-Semitic ideas and thoughts and how we deal with that? as people who work in memorial sites. That's an issue that I think isn't necessarily at the center of work in these memorial sites normally. It's often overlaid with many other ideas. You mentioned one thing as well, you know, the, the way in which these ideas are communicated is one getting emotional access to history, seeing yourself in relation to history. And this is an approach that plays an important role with you Marina as well, the sort of emotionally anchoring people or personal connection to the past. So you work very much with an idea that brings the past and the present together and tries to connect them. But Eva also said something else too, namely she talked about superficial knowledge as well that young people, and I would say it's probably not just young people, it's also adults, it's also multipliers, it's also professional groups who are worked with a lot at memorial sites too, they also bring these concepts with them as well. And this can be a problem if you're only ever focusing on, on today. So that would be maybe my question to you, Marina, namely, to what extent 
Or maybe you can explain your approach first and make it a little bit clearer how it's dealt with. You've got an anti-Semitic educational approach that refers to the Shoah, so people put themselves in relation to that. But can we assume that there's specific knowledge available that people know what actually took place in, during the Shoah, whether they are aware of the historical complexity of the Shoah? Maybe you can just say a little bit about how you deal with this in practice. And at the same time, I'd like to link this to another question too. And that is the study that you've recently done or are still doing in memorial sites. If I haven't got it wrong, there are interviews and groups that you're looking at at various different memorial sites in Germany. So how do you deal with anti-Semitism in memorial sites? Or what's your take on anti-Semitism at memorial sites in today's world? Oh, that's an excellent question. Not enough time. Do I have loads of time to answer it? I hope so. God, where do I even start there? OK, perhaps what I'll do is start with this, take a step back and say that there were some ex many interesting aspects. If you were really speaking straight from my heart, and there were so many things that you said that I could totally relate to in terms of many of the things that you said, I would have just confirmed nearly everything you said there. There's one thing I'd like to say, though, if we're talking about how we deal with the past or, you know, the loss of remembrance, you know, for many years, Shoah just wasn't even an issue and how it took quite a long time to really ignite and to, there being an installing of remembrance in, in here, which takes place in a certain routine form and takes certain content with it and excludes other content. It's, it's quite a fragile thing. It's not something that just lasts permanently. It's something that you have to renegotiate again and again. And I have a sense that even the consensus, which for 30 years has was there, that even this very social consensus is beginning to crumble, that the Shoah existed and that it took place. And the singularity of the mass murder of Jews in the way that it took place, that even that is being questioned again. I don't want to talk about it at any length. I just like to refer to the fact that this discussion often goes much deeper. And here in the panel as well, thanks to your questions and these very, you know, this very well-founded analysis from the other people on the panel here. But at the same time, if we're talking about education and this knowledge and transposing this onto the practical world. I always, something happens and there's a break. It loses depth to a certain extent. And it is sort of equipped with clear attitudes and aspirations and pedagogical moralizing objectives. And then the young people are very much at the focus. And what I always ask myself is why is that the case? I just wonder why is that the case? I mean, even we, who are really dealing with this, you know, we're almost junkies for it. We're totally obsessed with it in that sense, freaks, you know. I mean, my family's always asking, Marina, could you read a few other books? You know, you know, I know you, Miss Grubarova, I follow you, I read your texts and all that. But even in our talks, if we're talking about education, I have a sense that something's taking place, something's happening. So I would like to take a different approach to the question of education here. If we're talking about the question of what connection history has with educational processes, if we're talking about present day anti-Semitism, racism, other issues, then I would say history gives us a space and a framework. And this is a space and a framework that we must take seriously. Whoever it is that's learning in this space, who the people are, it's a post-Nazi society and it is a migrational society or post-nationalist society, I think the interpreter apologizes. These attitudes are there, these biographies are there, accesses, references to life, all of this is here and all of that shapes the space in which we want to learn something. So if we're talking about pedagogy, well, then there's always this idea of how did you describe it, Eva? A moral washing machine. 
yeah, this sort of immunization, you know, equipping, preventing. But there's just no depth to it because that's not how we learn. We just function differently. You know, wild, we have our own ideas, we have our own expectations, our own positions. We cannot be stuck into drawers like that and categorized like that. And these questions are not the questions of the youth alone. They are questions of the adult world, once for all of us. So where does this focusing on the youth come from in this context? I mean, what's that about? Are we really so incredibly well read? Have Do we know everything? Have we penetrated everything? You know, these young people are growing up quickly. They'll be adults tomorrow. But the adults were standing around and are standing around and have been for decades. They're just not at the focus. They are not at the focus. They never have to ask themselves any of these questions. Reflection spaces? I don't think so. We're working on their own biographies? Uh, why? Where? What for? you know, further education, training themselves about antisism. Do we even need that? But the young people, they have to go through all of this. You know, and that is a massive problem. You know, the sort of outsourcing of this problem that started basically at, you know, hour, hour zero, you know, this sort of distancing thing. Dandina I like to read as well, and his concepts are so stark. You know, he talks about a memory atrophy, a remembrance atrophy. This is something that still is very much with us today. You know, the Holocaust, Holocaust, which is created into an icon, and 30 years later, with a clear moral objective, the youth and the generations of posterity must be equipped against anti-Semitism and any form of racism. That's just not how it works. And this is why I certainly want to respond to your question, but I have to start somewhere else first, because this is something that's very close to my heart. And I'm really interested in this issue as to in all of our educational contexts, the target group, you know, to sort of see their needs, to see them differently and to focus on their needs in this context, and at the same time, of course, to recognize the boundaries of an approach like this and its limits. And I think we've just not done this. We haven't established these spaces for a reflection. And we've just sort of, you know, left it to the youth and the children in these various different eras of communicating the Shoah from a very cognitive transmission of what the Shoah was to an emotional, overwhelming one that these young people have grown up into adults and they have drawn a line under the path, they, uh, under the past and need nothing more to do with it. But the problem is in the current society that we're in, that if we draw a line under the past, we are drawing a line under many other things as well. And if we reject the past, then we are rejecting the impact and the results of this past. And then we really do have a big problem. The study that we commissioned and in many others well, actually not many others, in the other studies. For example, in the Samuel Seisborn statement and Eula Bernstein study, and in other more recent research, what we see very clearly is that critically engaging with anti-Semitism among teachers is means that you have to think about other issues as well. because. If they start thinking about anti-Semitism, they start thinking about their own history and their own socialization. And to describe this and a dialogue about anti-Semitism in their school starts to slowly develop into a discussion with themselves. And we're there we notice very clearly what it means to be given a space like this and at what point they want to begin to look at their own reference to anti-Semitism and to outline this. And if I look at our own study and all of the things that it's based on, I would say that the recognition, not that we haven't had this experience before, but we have, but the empirical recognition and understanding that making, that it's simply not possible to even talk about anti-Semitism, that the untangibility of anti-Semitism is a problem in itself, that the Metaphys the metaphors 
that come up, the riddles in conversations about anti-Semitism all lead to creating a sense of certainty and a position. And what I'm wondering, and it's not about these teachers, don't get me wrong, it's about the system. You know, how could it come about? This is what I'm wondering is how, you know, 75, 76 years after the Shoah, after our hour zero, the Stunde Null, as we hear it called, that this sort of discovery of something like right-wing extremism, racism, anti-Semitism, this is like this completely new thing. You know, if teachers then start describing, you know, it's taking, it, it exists, but I've never seen anything. I've never noticed anything. I've never perceived it. Anti-Semitism, I heard about it. I've heard it exists, but it's sort of, it regenerates, it emerges. I have no idea where it comes from. You know, this depersonalization, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with us. It's something that exists in a vacuum, in nowhere, and it just auto regenerates in some internet, some young people, they create it or what? You know, do, do you know what I'm trying to say here? It's sort of disembodied, but there are deep historical reasons for it. And one's own socialization and the history of learning of the people that we're questioning here is reflected here because they themselves experience it as something abstract. And since they experience it as something abstract, they find it incredibly difficult to make a connection to human beings, to human beings with their own individual experiences, their own subjective perception, what they experience in their own schools. Jewish young people and children don't even come up in the discussions. They talk about incidents, but not about the young people, not the students themselves, not their families, their needs, their issues are invisible and remain so. And of course, anti-Semitism isn't just the terrorist attack in Halle, and it's not just other attacks, but it's exoticizing, it's generalization, it's objectification, the incapacity of Jewish men and women and children to be seen as part of the society, the inability to connect it because the distance to history, and I would agree with Michel Wild, of course, history distances, and we need a certain distance to be able to approach history. It's just the dimension that we're talking about here of this approaching history, whether this distance is so comprehensive that there's no longer any emotional connection to it. Because in addressing an anti-Semitism, we also need a sort of history of relations to all of these issues. You know, a participant at one of our seminars said quite aptly, when I hear the word anti-Semitism, my grandfather is looking over my shoulder. I feel catapulted into a past into which I do not want to return. Or if a child in a tour, a study tour of a memorial site says, I don't want to do this. And the guy says, well, why not? And the kid says, I hate war, war is bad, Hitler was evil. And so I hate the Jews and that's why I don't want to do this. So these connections are ones that we have to remove the drama from, and we need to understand them. They are there. And distance and distancing of this kind that is just sort of denial, rejection, defense, defending ourselves against it means we're not entering into a relationship to history and the relationship to ourselves. This alienation is always self-alienation, and that's a disaster, because if we can't penetrate that, then how are we supposed to and take into ourselves these historical, historical connections. And this is why it's always the history of the Shoah and its impact and national socialism in a specific learning space. And this has to be at the focus of it again, and then look at the needs of the people involved as well and their issues and coming up with options for this. And it works, it works really well and it has for a very long time. And to create spaces for reflection, where it's not just about creating a relationship to history, but also to reflect on a, a connection to oneself. And the group here is a resource. It's a transactional space. If it's structured properly and facilitated properly and reflected properly, a lot can happen. And of course, a great deal of input and increase of knowledge, these sort of repositories of knowledge have to be filled. And we are very cautious and careful in approaching these issues and naturally 
our target groups are always seen against the context of their vocational and political work. So the analysis of society, the analysis of the methods, this sort of collective biographical reflections are in dovetailed in this approach here methodologically as well. And this is why our formats hardly work with young people, rarely, occasionally. Our main target is in the initial and further training of adults, important people that are in important positions in our society that have an impact. And I feel that this is a contribution, a contribution not just to the debate among professionals, but also in terms of sustainable and effective framework formats and methods in order to really reach the important stakeholders, to really reach them. And we are happy to work within institutions. We support structural change processes. We support schools setting up anti-discrimination concepts and bodies. And of course, we work intersectionally as well. So we can speak of anti-Semitism in a space of experience in which racism and other forms of collective hostility are active and do their separating work. It's been mentioned, school is a central place through which all children have to go and the memorial site is something they can do with that i'm not sure that as a jewish mom i would send my child there or wherever many jewish parents struggle with that and this is also something that remains invisible which creates dilemmas with regard to the way history is being conveyed and taught there and also the, the thing that it does to parents knowing that their children's needs with the background of families that were affected by the Shoah are not at the center and that their needs are being ignored this is something inherent to our school system and also inherent to memorial sites and i can tell you much more about the results of the study yes thank you very much marina we need to leave it here at this point, I would not ask my own questions because I can see so many questions from the audience. And I would like to now invite my colleague, Matthias Haas, who's collected the questions. And I think there were also some questions from Michael Will there. Yeah, ich, uh, That's correct. Good evening. Good evening. It's, uh, it's now my task Fragen, die, uh, to uh, in, in, so bring the many, many questions to you and to bundle these. I won't be able to bring them all. Um, I'll try to group them also, and try to cover um, as much of Fragen, what was asked as I can. Das in, in, There's in, in one in area of questions also, which are sort, sort of overarching. So we have a commissioner on anti-Semitism, but wouldn't we have to think along intersectional lines and also focus on other types of discrimination? And on the other hand, in anti-racism initiatives, there's a lot of public action, for example, in the Black Lives Matter protest marches, but we didn't see the same sort of activity with regard to other forms of discrimination discrimination, for example, or anti-Semitism, for example, with the, with the example of the Halle attack. And the questions go along these lines. Then there's questions on value-guided value guidance in life. What should this sort of guidance look like? Would it, wouldn't it have to look at human rights in general? Shouldn't these refer to Wanting emotional access points, shouldn't these emotional access points be tied to other topics like helping those who are about to drown in the Mediterranean Sea? Shouldn't we have to come out of anti-Semitism and create broader access portals? And also on emotional versus cognitive sorts of 
Ähm, Learning und es gab dann the purchase, mal there were a couple of questions on that too. Also zu, zu and then there's another Rolle, set of questions on the political role memorial sites could play, couldn't at least close their doors for a AFT party staatlichen Sicherheitsorganen ähm, um, followers wer prüft das we have was machen wir allerdings auch damit wenn sich in die Mitte der Gesellschaft ähm, Einstellung vorhanden sind wie wir bei der Mangel in der Aufklärung um, auch von Right in the center of der, äh, society, there's resentments, like in the case das ist of the NSU der, ähm, attacks in Germany, and then there's the controversy in, ähm, right there at the end. Position, at wir, what point? Teilen, und das gab aber dann doch Openness. Frage. Ähm, inwieweit dann so eine Kampagne wie BDS ähm, nicht auch mit Challenge to ist und inwieweit campaigns auch like the IS one, which ähm, is also anti-Semitic. Ähm, in einer Frage formuliert war ein And Aufruf, then somebody, der who's, namentlich von Herrn Wild mit unterstützt wurde, dass es mehr call, Beinfreiheit verschaffen würde. Ich zitiere das which äh, durch Mr. öffentliche Wild Förderung. Supported, ähm, und, giving und wie the passt IS das more zusammen? Space also in public so einem Spannungsfeld. Das ist jetzt funding. ein breites so how does Dingfeld this für all fit in? die letzten sieben Minuten. So Aber ich habe das versucht, jetzt möglichst viele, wir haben ja gebeten, Fragen zu stellen. Give you the full spectrum of, of questions that came in. Okay, and you two were was you were using the wrong channel, namely the English channel. So there was no translation, but um, we weren't able to change that. So I'm sorry. I apologize to our English speaking participants because uh, the questions were just not translated. So you might not have been able to change the channel. Okay. But as you ended at Michael Wilt's um, part in this, maybe we can come to you, Michael. Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, I'll start answering the last question. I'm sorry, I don't think we can cover this point here. Let's come to the topic of memorial sites and human rights refugees. Of course, these are all incredibly important task for society but today we're talking of the Shoah and victims of national socialism and we just repeated just how important it is to have memorial sites as authentic sites of commemoration former concentration camps or the house of the Wannsee conference where today 79 years ago a decision was taken about mass murder where bureaucrats were state secretaries and public officers, civil servants, agreed on the mass extinction of millions of people. And 29, 79 years ago, people who were part of the state administration joined the meeting. It was the state secretary of the Ministry of the Interior who sat here Let's just establish this connection and quote Paul Hilberg. This is the regular German state bureaucracy, which decided about putting this mass extermination of people, of human lives in, in motion. So this means we have to think about the way we organize our state. Could it be that there's administrative processes in our state which enable for mass extermination to be organized along the lines of division of labor, ignoring the responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis human rights. So this is what we have to look at. This is a situation we have to understand in the context of today. This is what these places tell us about what our ancestors, what people living here before us did 79 years ago at the Wannsee Conference, where they agreed about mass extermination. This is a challenge for us today. We need to see this clearly. What is a state like today? Which way is it organized today? What 
would the rule of law state have to look like? So this type of bureaucracy up to the point of organizing mass killing can never happen again. I think this is the process of reflection we really need to engage in. And Marina Chenevsky is so right in saying we need this type of reflection. Of course, we also know need knowledge on history, but we do need to engage in self-reflection. It isn't just some part of remote history, which we have to learn about and understand, and then it's not going to touch us anymore. No, it is the very impact history has to this very day. And because something happened here in Germany, something was started from within Germany and in and this something started in a way that almost seemed to be imperceptible at the start let me just make one remark Sebastian Hoffmann in his memories spoke about the way how in April 1939 all the people around him people from the bourgeois center of society all of a sudden knew how many Jews there were in the at the hospitals, at the newsrooms, and everyone would so, all of a sudden start mentioning these percentages on Jews in society. And when all of a sudden people start knowing exactly where there are Jews in society, I mean, this does not happen um, accidentally in this COVID-19 conspiracy group. It's not a coincidence that they are going back to structural anti-Semitism and we can see them right in the heart of society. This is where we can see that anti-Semitism is far from having disappeared, but in a certain constellation, it, it comes back up. And this is right at the heart of society, as I'm saying. So, Marina, maybe um, you would like to react and respond to the questions that have reached us. And you really need to be very brief because at 9 p.m. our event is supposed to end. Michael Wild mentioned structural anti-Semitism. I would like to support this because it's not just a number of errors that a number of people made, but this is a structural problem and we can touch it with our own hands today. Unfortunately, it needs tragedies like the Halle attack or these uh, terrible um, anti-COVID-19 um, protest marches using a reference to the Shoah. And it is an indication of the, the little knowledge there is about anti-Semitism in today's society. And let's come back to the question of establishing this connection. Here's the connection between the past and the present because this is the way people relate back to the past, even in such ways. So there's a long history of outsourcing this connection and of not connecting. And it's very difficult to break up this tradition and this process. Many people grew up never even dealing with history in this way which is why we need these spaces of reflection, which enable us to do just that. And it is not a contradiction with the aspect of acquiring knowledge. We do need knowledge all the time, but it's not gonna save us. It's not the only thing we need in order to take a stand or to make a connection between ourselves and the past. In our study, we were able to see that many of the teachers we surveyed were able to define what anti-Semitism is. They have an idea of it, but they cannot use this knowledge in their work because in a critical moment, they uh, all of a sudden feel uncertainty. And this is where we have to start. There's one last thing I would like to say, and then I'm done and I won't 
be able to answer all the questions, but I can tell that there's a certain concern from the questions I read that through a stronger debate on anti-Semitism, human rights might be put second instead of being put first. And I would like to take this worry off your shoulders, dear colleagues, because dealing with anti-Semitism is pretty recent. 20 years ago, there weren't even any studies on the way anti-Semitism would be dealt with. It was 20 years ago to the day, more or less, that a new research scene has uh, been established, also supported by a number of state-aided programs and schemes, programs that um, were about focusing on anti-Semitism, really um, looking into anti-Semitism at a number of levels. So this work is in progress, the political work on it, the method methodological work on it, the um, education side of it. The process is long from being concluded. And this was a consequence from decades of not dealing with the topic. So it's now explicitly putting a finger on the wound and Doing that will not stop us from dealing with human rights and from educating people to live democratic values. But we cannot leave anti-Semitism out of the equation. It is more than evident that there's very little theoretical and practical work and that we will have to develop all that. So this is a concern that at times troubles me and makes me sad because I just simply think that there wasn't enough of it and there can never be enough of it because specificity and the questions that anti-Semitism raises are so important in order to understand what is going on and also they're so important to understand all the other topics there are in this country. Amongst them, the way we deal with um, refugees, with um, the violation of human rights and the like. Understanding anti-Semitism can help us deal with the other topics as well. So let's not put a priority mark on any of these urgent topics. They're all urgent and there is an intersectional connection between them, but uh, it never means um, leveling everything out. It doesn't mean putting one first and the other second. It means working on these topics in parallel or sequentially in a means to establish a connection, but it does not mean replacing one topic by another. It can't be, it shouldn't be. We need to forge new alliances. Many people are working on that. There's many organizations working on that also between communities because this has to do with minorities. It's not just the Jewish people, but also the other minorities who want to have a say for this type of discourse and uh, this uh, dealing with the future. Eva, would you like to take the floor again? What's What's your take? Well, I really would only want to say one or two sentences just to underline and agree with what Marina just said. I think today today's topic was anti-Semitism. We've explained why it is so important and we've explained what the effect is, what the impact is on Jewish people living in Germany today. This process is very, very far from being concluded. And every other German would want to put a full stop after the topic, but nobody who would fully have grasped what this is all about would ever want to draw a finishing line here. 
anti-Semitism is a topic we need to embody and uh, we need to do something about it and yet also focus on the other types of xenophobia. And um, the other related topics. Okay, thanks, Eva, for mentioning that there's more topics to be looked at beyond anti-Semitism. I think this is a good final word. I think um, do we agreed on the fact that the past and the present in general, and in particular Shoah, are related. First, this event was supposed to set a first impulse to give you some food for thought on what this might mean hands-on for memorial sites. And also in this regard, we're still in the initial stages of a debate. Dear, dear audience, please do not think that we're withdrawing from answering your questions. I would like to suggest we collect your questions and answer them on our blog and have our speakers answer them so we can publish the answers on our blog. This is our suggestion and this would be the way we can answer the questions that simply went a bit um, beyond today's possibilities time-wise and yet we would answer these questions eventually, even if in writing. I would now like to thank everyone. I would like to say thanks to Michael Wild, Eva Gruberova, and Marina Czernivsky, and also thank you to Samuel Salzborn, who pronounced the initial words of welcome. Thanks a lot for your inputs and your contributions. I really think that we will need to let this sink in. We talked a lot about reflection, and I think it is a bit of self-reflection we all have to engage in now. To ask ourselves about the ways we will relate to what was said today and what impacts this will have for our work and for our everyday life. I would like to also say thank you to our colleagues at the memorial site who contributed to organizing this event. And I would like to say thank you to all participants. Thanks for staying with us for a full two hours. Of course, no virtual event can ever replace a personal encounter. And I hope that maybe in the course of this year or in the next year at the latest, I really hope to see you all again at our memorial site. I'd like to wish you a great evening. Have a good rest of the week. We're always happy to hear your feedback and your comments. Please get in touch anytime. Also across our social media channels and all other media. Thank you. Thank you.